Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time it is a review of the 1972 TV movie, The Night Stalker. Now, this is a massively popular TV movie. In, in a lot of ways, you could argue that it is one of the most popular made-for-TV movies of all time. Because it earned a 33.4 rating and it got it then unheard of 54.4 share when it aired on ABC in 1972 that had never happened before for any TV movie before the Night Stalker and after seeing the film I can see why it was such a instant amazing success because when you compare the Night Stalker with other feature films from the same time period in the early 70s, it fits right in line with all of them. So this was unheard of to see a TV movie that actually looked like it could be released in the theater. And it was a TV movie that you're seeing for free on network television. And it was a film that you could have easily paid to see. And it actually was a huge success, not only in terms of the ratings, but it spawned a sequel, The Night Strangler. It also spawned a TV series, which has gone on to become a enormous cult classic with a lot of different people, including myself, called Kolchak the Night Stalker. It also inspired Chris Carter, who would go on to make The X-Files. Because he saw this show when he was younger and he was a big fan of the show and he was inspired to make a show that dealt with a reporter sort of it's sort of like it's sort of a monster movie of the week sort of thing like what Colchat the Night Stalker did more of a serious take on these kind of uh, supernatural goings on but with a little bit of a tongue in cheek sense of humor and that would eventually become the X-Files. Uh, he even asked Carl, he even, he even asked Carl Kolchak himself, Darren McGavin, uh, if he wanted to reprise his role as Kolchak in the X-Files. He declined, but he still played a character in, in the series as the father of the X-Files. So, Chris Carter was really a huge fan of this show, of this TV movie, and of everything that came afterwards. And in a lot of ways, you can thank this movie for The X-Files. Because if Chris Carter never saw The Night Stalker, or the sequel, or the TV series, he might not have ever had the inspiration to create The X-Files. So, that's another thing. That's, that's, that's just an amazing legacy that this uh, film, and that this entire franchise has now it's not only its impact that is that is uh noteworthy but the fact that there are so many talented people uh who were involved with the film behind the camera uh behind the typewriter so to speak and in front of the camera so first off you had dan curtis who at this time was a really sought after and respected producer at the time because he had he was working on Dark Shadows which was a gigantic hit on television screens at the same time that this uh, series aired I mean this 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 feature film aired and having him on board it was just it, it was just uh, just something that you don't see very often where you have like a really talented film produ you know, TV producer who is producing a TV movie. Because TV movies really weren't considered to be anything that, that was that big of a deal until this movie. This movie comes out and then all these other networks are like, okay, we're going to throw some more money at our TV movies. We're actually going to put more of an effort into them. And they would also try to get people like Curtis or other people involved... And it's not only Curtis who, who lends his hand to this production, but it's also other talented people like Richard Matheson, who is an amazingly talented writer, 
who is one of the most legendary writers of his time. And he was responsible for adapting the unpublished novel, The Kolchak Papers, by Jeff Rice, into the teleplay for this TV movie. So that's another added layer, another added advantage that this film has over other TV movies at the time, and even feature films. I mean, you have Dan Curtis involved. You have Richard Matheson, who is one of the most respected and well-renowned writers. So it's one of those things where it's just a tour de force of talents that are working on the film. And then you have a very established director in John Lillowin Moxie, who had a lot of experience with TV movies as well as feature films. Then you have the cast where it's spearheaded by the perfect guy for the role, Darren McGavin. Like, when you watch this film and you watch uh, anything with Colchette the Night Stalker, you realize that Darren McGavin was born to play this role of Carl Kolchak. He has the perfect amount of wit. He has, uh, he, he's a character that you can tell that Darren really loves playing. Like, he's really going for it, and he's really passionate about the performance. And it's another thing where it really does give Darren an ability to really excel when it comes to his own personal strengths as an actor. He's really good at playing fiery characters and, and characters who have a lot of moxie and attitude. And what what better role than Carl Kolchak? Uh, it, it's it's a absolute perfect pairing of talents with a particular character, with a fictional character. Which is why any other attempt to try to recapture that has failed miserably. Uh, I, 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 there's only one Carl Kolchak, and it's Darren McGavin. There, there's, there's, no, there's no one else that can actually play this role with the same gusto and do it effectively. You also had Carol Lindley, who plays Gail Foster who is the love interest in the film. And she's a nice, pretty face. And her performance is fine. She does good with what she's asked to do, but her character doesn't really get to do that much. Simon Oakland it plays uh, Carl Kolchak's thorn in his side and Tony Vincenzo. The chemistry between Darren McGavin and Tony is just electric. They, it's just, they send sparks... And th their personalities are perfect for each other. And the banter that goes back and forth between them is really a lot of fun. Ralph Meeker plays Bernie Jenks. Uh, I believe is like kind of a ca uh, captain or something. I I'm trying to remember exactly who, who Bernie Jenks' character was. Uh, Claude Akins plays the sheriff, uh, Warren A. Butcher. Charles McGraw plays police chief Ed Masterson. You also uh, have Elisha Cook Jr. plays Mickey Crawford. Kent Smith plays a district attorney named Tom Payne. You also have Larry Linville, who you might recognize from MASH. He plays Dr. Robert uh, Makajiri. And you also have Barry Atwater, who plays the Night Stalker, the, the vampire, uh, Janos Skorzeny. Now... The film also features a score by Bob Cobert, cinematography by Michael Hugo, and it's edited by Desmond Marquette. Now, it has a running time of about 74 minutes, uh, which is honestly just about the right amount of time for this particular film and this plot. And it had a budget of around $450,000, which doesn't seem like a lot now, but back in 1972 for a TV movie, that's a considerable chunk of change. And it's definitely on the screen. Because when you look at, like, like I was saying earlier, when you compare this with other films from the same era, especially TV movies, this is leagues above its peers in that respect. And a big reason is because of the budget that it was provided. And because of the people who were involved with the story, as well as bringing the story to life on screen. Now, 
the plot is pretty straightforward. There's this killer who's going around killing uh, women and just it's going on a killing spree. And these victims are found with their bodies drained of blood. And this is taking place in Las Vegas, which is a nice, interesting setting for a film like this because this is Vegas before the Vegas that we all know. It's... It's proto-Vegas, and there's something really eerie about the proto-Vegas setting. And also the fact that you have stuff going on on the Sunset Strip, and you have like this just horror elements that are thrown into Vegas, and it just makes for a really interesting setting. And it's also a lot of fun to watch this film and look at proto-Vegas, you know, what Vegas used to look like compared to what it looks like today. And so this killer is going around killing victims. It's sucking blood out of them. And Carl Kolchak, who's a reporter who's bounced from place to place, he comes upon this case, does some digging, and comes up with the conclusion that it's a vampire. And of course, everyone else around him doesn't believe him. And so it's up to him to stop this uh, Night Stalker's reign of terror because no one else really believes that he's actually a vampire. Uh, even though there's a lot of evidence that shows that he's not human, uh, the state, of course, and the police are still leaning towards the fact that, no, it's got to be something uh, non-supernatural that's involved. He gets some, uh, some help with uh, 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 another, uh, I think it's like a records keeper or some other guy, and he helps them out with uh, with the uh, particular case. Actually, there was another guy who was, I think he knew from a previous uh, job or something like that. I'm trying to remember what the name of the guy is. I think it might be um, his, it's one of his friends. And um, yeah, I, I don't remember the, the exact name of this guy. I, I think it might have been... Maybe it was Ralph Meeker. Maybe it was Ralph Meeker who... Uh, who, But I, I'm not 100% sure on that. So, like I was saying earlier, it's up to Kol Kolchak to finally stop this vampire. So he actually gets some help from one of his uh, law enforcement friends. And he finds out where the vampire lives. And it's a nice setting. It's a nice uh, bit of atmosphere. Uh, the old dark house sort of thing. That's really honestly kind of what it's like near the end. It's like the old dark house with a vampire in it. He encounters Yano Scorzini. And he eventually drives a stake through his heart. And of course, uh, after he does that, now, now the police are mad at him because he, disobe he disobeyed their orders. They were trying to tell him not to do that, and he did it anyway. So they want to charge him for, for murder. And essentially, they blackmail him, and he leaves Vegas. And now he's in search of another job. And uh, he's recording all these fantastical events that he was involved with on a tape recorder. And that's essentially how the film ends. Now, I know I went through like a really super quick synopsis of it, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown because it's just a really just to really show you how you can have a very straightforward story and it can still be really compelling and really interesting. Uh, the, the, and it also helps a lot when you have a character in Carl Kolchak that's as likable and as personable and as enjoyable to watch. I mean, that really, de that, that, that really does help uh, immensely. You can have a straightforward plot that doesn't have a lot of frills that can be really entertaining and enthralling as long as you have characters that you care about and you can latch on to. And Coltrack is definitely one of those characters. I thought the direction by uh, Moxley, it, it's Moxie is actually his last name. So John Little and Moxie, his direction, it's, it's fine. It's nothing particularly spectacular, but for a TV film, it at least feels and looks like a feature film product 
from the particular time period of the early 70s. So it doesn't feel like it's a step below a feature film, which is what a lot of TV movies at the time did look and feel like. He does a good job getting the most out of his actors, setting up certain shots. There's nothing particularly mind-blowing about any of his shots, but they, they, they he does a really serviceable job. Uh, some of the best shots that he's done, he, he puts together, though, are the ones that show the Night Stalker in, like, a silhouette, or, like, or you see just, like, a, see his eyes staring in the darkness, and some of the shots uh, in, his, in the Night Stalker's home. I thought those were pretty uh, well put together, as too. And uh, some of the other sequences where you have the Night Stalker stalking his victims and, and so on and so forth. But really where the film shines is with its script by Richard Matheson. It's got a lot of fun, witty, punchy dialogue. Uh, I love that one of the first... I, I think it's actually the first introduction of a murder victim to Carl Kolchak, the, the, the reporter, is this really fascinating murder scene where it's in the middle of this sand quarry. It's just, there's just all this sand everywhere. And there's a dead body of this woman that's just laying face down in the middle of this sand pit. And there's no footprints. There's no anything. So I, I love how eerie and bizarre that is because it really does evoke something supernatural because it definitely is not normal. There's no footprints. So how did that body end up in that sand pit if there's no footprints? And then you find out that her blood is also missing out of the body. And there's like these two bite marks and stuff. And so you're like, oh, okay. All right. Now things are getting really intriguing here. This is not your typical murder case. And I thought the blending of traditional reporting uh, drama with the supernatural was really innovative and it was really inspired, especially in this in this film and in, in the sequel and in the TV series that would follow it. So Richard Matheson is just a master and he really wrote a masterful teleplay. And the only other things I can kind of think of about the movie are, I mean, there are a few things that I, I was kind of not, I was not really that keen on about the movie. For one, I did not like the fact, I didn't, I did not like how they handled the vampire later in the film. I, I felt that they kind of, they, I felt that the, I don't know if it was Matheson's fault or the, or the studio or, or, you know, the television, uh, guys you know the the producers or dan curtis but i just didn't like the fact that the vampire was just this hissing mute guy uh he you know he, he would show up later when he's when kolchak first encounters him and he'd do the typical cliched <laughs> you know with the fangs and i i always felt that that was kind of silly why are vampires doing that anyway? They're not cats. Cats hiss. Uh, have you ever seen a bat turn around and go, <sighs> no, I, I've never seen a bat do that. So if they're supposed to be kind of inspired by bats, why are they hissing? I, I never got the hissing thing from vampires in vampire films. I just, I, I personally just don't find it uh, really good at all like i i think it's just dumb and, uh, and, it, and it's pretty silly and it was definitely silly here because there were a couple scenes where i felt the the impact was lost with uh how creepy the scene could be when all of a sudden uh janos has turned around and going <laughs> you know i was just like come on we, we don't we don't need the hissing thing but that's just that's just a extreme nitpick it doesn't really affect my enjoyment of the film or the overall rating of the film and the only other thing i can think of is the score isn't as memorable as the main titles for the tv series and it really doesn't necessarily add a lot to the film there are a lot of moments where the music could really add more to the mood and the atmosphere but 
the score doesn't really do that. So it's just a very workmanlike score that's in one ear and out the other. But other than that, I mean, I can't really think of anything else about the Night Stalker that didn't really work. It's got really good pacing. It's got a plot that, like I said, is straightforward, but with the characters and with the overall way that it shows what's going on with with how it handles this concept, it really makes it feel like it's something fresh and new, especially for the time period. Think about it. You've really never seen anything like the Night Stalker until this aired. There really weren't serious investigative reporter shows or films where a serious sort of take was being uh, used for the supernatural where you're combining elements of traditional reporting shows or stories with vampires. That really wasn't something that was done in, in this time period. It, it isn't really done that often other than maybe stuff like the X-Files or Fringe or where I think it was like something called Warehouse. Was it Warehouse 13? It was some show that was on, uh, I believe, uh, was it USA or some other network? So there, there or maybe it was a sci-fi channel original. So nowadays you can see more of those sort of shows where there's like a serious take on the supernatural with, with the police involved and with uh, newspaper reporters. But back then it was a really inspired, unique thing. And it's just one of those time capsule films that really does transport you to this particular era, this time period of the early 1970s. And it doesn't seem like it's too dated or anything. It just, it, it's a story that's still effective and it's still as efficient as it was in 1972. It's just one of those films that really does stand the test of time. I would say it's a, it's a quite timeless affair. And definitely one of my favorite television films that I've personally seen. And I've only seen it once. The most recent time that I watched it is was the first time that I saw the film. I grew up watching the show on the Sci-Fi Channel whenever I got the chance to see a rerun. So I never really knew that much about the show. I mean, about the movie. Because I knew a lot about the show. I knew that that was something that existed. But I didn't know that there was a film. So... Seeing this was really a, a a lot of fun, and I can see why it was it was as big as it was, and why it's still a very popular, well loved film by many. So, yeah, I mean, it's got everything you you honestly could want out of a television movie, let alone a feature film from the early seventies. You got solid direction, you got an excellent screenplay. Uh, you have a cast and crew who are really giving their all. You have a concept and an idea that feels fresh and somewhat innovative, especially for the time period. It's it's well paced. It isn't boring. It's uh, entertaining. It's witty. It's clever, and it also has a, a few creepy moments. So it's not entirely just all jokes or just super super serious, and it's one of those films that definitely does a great job balancing different elements that are not really necessarily that easy to do. The stuff when it comes like okay, when it needs to be taken seriously, it's serious. But when it when it tries to play with when it wants to play with conventions or it wants to have some fun, it does that with uh, equal effectiveness. And that that's something that a lot of TV movies miss. And a lot of films, period, miss is that fine balance, that that fine line. Uh, so it's one of those things that it this type of film that's this high quality makes it look easy, but trust me, it isn't. And I've seen plenty of TV movies, and a lot of them don't even come close to the Night Stalker, and for a reason. And then and. I don't really know what else to say about the Night Stalker. I've kind of said my piece. I've talked your ear off enough. I would say if you haven't seen it, 
I recommend giving it a watch. It's definitely worth a watch at least once if you haven't seen the film, just to see what people were so crazy about in the early 70s. Just to see a, a film that really revolutioni revolutionized the TV movie. Anyway, um, yeah, if I were to rate it out of five stars, I'd give it four and a half out of five. Like I said, there's just little tiny little issues that I have with it. But other than that, it's a very close to perfect film, especially uh, in its particular arena. Anyway, thanks for watching. And as always, I will see you later. See ya.